This is Space Time Series 23, Episode 95. Coming up on Space Time, the biggest black hole collision ever detected, a new estimate for the age of Earth's core, and China launches a top secret reusable space plane. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Scientists have observed the most massive black hole collision ever seen. The event, catalogued as GW190521, was picked up by the LIGO and Virgo gravitational wave detectors in the United States and Italy. Gravitational waves are reverberations rippling through the fabric of space-time. They're caused by the movement of mass and were first predicted by Albert Einstein in his 1915 general theory of relativity. A report in the journal Physical Review Letters and in the Astrophysical Journal Letters says the collision on May the 21st last year involved a pair of rapidly spinning black holes, one with some 85 times the mass of the Sun, the other with around 66 solar masses. The signal, resembling four very short squiggles, was extremely brief in duration, lasting less than a tenth of a second. It appears to have originated from a point about 7 billion light years away. That's a time when the universe was just half its present age, and it makes it one of the most distant gravitational wave sources ever detected. The authors also measured each black hole's spin, discovering that as the black holes were circling ever closer together, they could have been spinning about their own axes at angles which were out of alignment with the axis of their orbits. The black hole's misaligned spins likely caused their orbits to wobble or precess as these two goliaths spiraled towards each other. The merger created an even more massive black hole, about 142 solar masses, in the process releasing an enormous amount of energy, equivalent to around eight times the mass of our Sun, which then spread across the universe in the form of gravitational waves. This discovery is even more remarkable considering science's current understanding of physics predicts that stars between around 65 and 130 times the mass of the Sun usually undergo a process called parent stability resulting in the stars being totally blown apart and leaving nothing behind. OK, let's go back a few steps here. According to the physics of stellar evolution, stars are really giant hydrodynamic balancing acts, with the outward pressure of the photons and gas in the star's core supporting it against the force of gravity pushing downwards or inwards. The end result is a star that's stable like our Sun. However, once stars run out of the fuel to keep the nuclear fusion process in their cores going, they can no longer produce enough pressure to support their own mass, and gravity wins, causing the star to collapse inwards under its own weight in an explosion called a Type II or core collapse supernova. Now, this will usually leave either an incredibly dense object called a neutron star, in which the protons and electrons in the star's core have literally been crushed together to form neutrons, or an even more extreme object of infinite density in zero volume called a black hole, an object whose gravity is so strong that nothing, not even light, can escape. Now, all the black holes observed so far fit into one of two categories. There are either stellar mass black holes, created through the collapse of giant stars far more massive than the sun, as we've discussed, or they're supermassive black holes, the monsters thought to exist at the centres of most, if not all, galaxies which contain hundreds of thousands to millions and even billions of times the mass of the Sun. Now, science's understanding of stellar evolution explains how stars with masses of, say, 130 times that of the Sun can produce black holes that are up to 65 solar masses in size. But for heavier stars, those that produce black holes between 65 and 135 solar masses, a new phenomenon, known as parent stability, is thought to kick in. Now, in these stars, when the core's photons become extremely energetic, they're thought to morph into electron-positron, that is, matter-antimatter pairs. And, of course, matter and antimatter annihilate each other. So the star experiences one or more short episodes of instability, each of which causes a significant fraction of the star's mass to be converted into gamma rays. 
Now, at the end of this process, the star's now lost enough mass to explode into a supernova, which results in a black hole of less than 65 solar masses. Now, alternatively, the entire star becomes unstable against gravitational collapse, and the resulting explosion strong enough to leave nothing behind. But this pair instability scenario only works in a very specific mass range. For more massive stars, those above, say, 200 solar masses, they'd simply collapse directly into a black hole of at least 135 solar masses. Now, what all this means is that a collapsing star shouldn't be able to produce a black hole between around 65 and 135 solar masses. That's the range known as the pair instability mass gap. Now, assuming there's some wiggle room at the lower end of this mass range to explain a 66 solar mass black hole, the larger black hole, the one with 85 times the mass of the Sun, still falls squarely into this upper black hole mass gap, and therefore it shouldn't exist. So if it wasn't created by the collapse of a star, how then did the black hole form? One of the study's authors, Professor Susan Scott from the Australian National University, thinks this mammoth black hole probably started out a lot smaller, but then grew in mass as it cannibalised more and more stars, planets and gas clouds through the ages or through mergers with other black holes. Black holes with masses of between 100 and 100,000 times the mass of the Sun are called intermediate mass black holes. We don't know much about them because we don't normally find many of them. We know they're heavier than stellar mass black holes and lighter than supermassive black holes, but really that's really about it. We don't really know how they're made until now. And there's been no conclusive electromagnetic observations for intermediate mass black holes within that 100 to 1000 solar mass range. Scott, who's also the chief investigator with OSGRAV, the Australian Research Council's Centre of Excellence for Gravitational Wave Discovery, says seeing how this black hole formed confirms that intermediate mass black holes are created through the merger of two smaller stellar mass black holes. This recent event has been quite remarkable in that we've achieved a number of firsts with it. And the first one of those is that it's significantly the heaviest of the black hole binary systems that we've detected so far. Resultant black hole is almost twice the mass of our heaviest previous black hole that we obtained through gravitational wave detection. So that was quite extraordinary. And then the second remarkable fact is that one of the two black holes that formed the resultant black hole in this big collision actually falls in the range of black hole masses, which we call the upper black hole mass gap. So it's, it's thought that black holes in the range between about 65 and let's say 135 times the mass of the sun can't form due to a process called pair instability. So stars of, in that sort of mass range become unstable and blow themselves up, leaving nothing behind. So in this collision, one of our two black holes actually falls in that forbidden range. So the question immediately arises, if it didn't form from the collapse of a star, then how did it form? Can you explain pair instability for us? It's something <laughs> sort to happen in a star when basically the production of electron and positron pairs in the stellar core softens the equation of space of the star and that removes pressure support for the star. And this leads to a contraction of the core and it raises the internal temperature up to the ignition of, say, oxygen or silicon and the star becomes unstable and this leads to it blowing itself up. And it's projected to happen to stars of a certain mass range and that means that because of this process, we do not expect to find black holes coming from collapse of stars in that mass range, resulting in black holes of masses between about 65 and 135 times the mass of the sun. And the third point is that the resultant black hole at about 142 times the mass of the sun falls into the range of black hole masses, which we call intermediate mass black holes. And they range from about 100 to 100,000 times the mass of the sun. And this is the first direct observation of an intermediate mass black hole. So that was another really remarkable first. What this is telling us, this process, is how intermediate mass black holes are made. Yes, well, exactly. Not only did we 
make the first direct observation of an intermediate mass black hole, but we actually saw how it formed. And it formed from two smaller black holes. And so we do know already now through this one observation that intermediate mass black holes can and are formed through a hierarchical process of black hole, small black holes merging. It's not to say that an intermediate mass black hole can't be formed through gravitational collapse as well, but we have this additional process that we know is, is occurring out there in the universe. So is that another step on the ladder of working out how supermassive black holes are formed? Yes, it's absolutely a, a, a critical step because it, it shows us that there is the possibility for intermediate mass black holes to themselves be emerging and potentially eventually building up to these Goliath supermassive black holes that we find in the centres of galaxies. And the other interesting point I found in this story was the location of this merger. It was a long way away. In fact, it's one of the most distant gravitational wave sources ever detected. Yes, this event was one of our most distant gravitational wave detections. It occurred when the universe was about 7 billion years old, which is about half its present age. So we're very, very interested to probe that period, you know, we know the rate of star formation was, was different then, and we're keen to get more information through these sort of detections, which we now know we can do, and really probe that quite early part of the universe. And the signal that LIGO and Virgo were able to get from this gravitational wave event also told us a lot about the progenitor black holes involved, didn't it? What they were yes, doing, it, their spin axis, how they related to each other. Yes, exactly. And I, already an unusual thing about this signal is that it was definitely our shortest merger signal that we've ob- obtained so far, less than about a tenth of a second. And that's because of the size of the black holes. Every time they perform one cycle around each other, because of their size, they're emitting a lot of gravitational radiation. So that we picked up of only about four cycles before the, the merger itself. So this was already a very extraordinary kind of gravitational wave signal from our past experience. But yes, we were able to tell certain things about the system. And we know the black holes were really quite uh, spinning quite rapidly. Uh, we know that uh, this, it suggested from our uh, measurements that the spins of the black holes not particularly well aligned with the spin of the orbit. So, yes, there are some interesting facts about this system um, which we have been able to um, ascertain. And all of these sort of, uh, all this type of information about each system we detect gives us more information about possibilities of how these black holes get together in the first place. Are there lots of black hole merger candidates that LIGO and Virgo are are analysing at the moment? Yes, the black hole binary mergers are like our bread and butter detections at the moment. I mean, obviously, other things are happening, but with increasing sensitivity of the interferometers, we are detecting binary black hole systems very regularly. And this is absolutely fantastic because, well, just with this event alone, we're populating parts of the black hole mass spectrum that weren't populated before. And as you may recall, with earlier events, we've been populating the lower black hole mass gap as well. And we've directly observed an intermediate mass black hole. So we want to do population synthesis as well with these binary black hole systems to tell us how many there are out there, what sizes the black holes are, what sort of environments they formed in, you know, whether they're in the near supermassive black holes in the centre of galaxies or whether they're isolated or in globular clusters. We can do an amazing amount of science with these increasing number of detections. The indications appear to be that these events, both black hole mergers and also mergers of neutron stars and black holes, could be a lot more common than we think. Yes, that's absolutely true. We you know, realise that there are a large number of these collisions going on throughout the universe at any given time, and we need to study these events. There could be implications for composition of dark matter. Um, There's all sorts of possibilities. But once we have neutron stars thrown into the the mix, then we're finding out a lot of information about those objects as well through these collisions. So, yeah, yeah, we're telling, we're, we're discovering a lot about the lives of black holes throughout the universe, basically. It wasn't all that long ago that Cygnus X1 was really exciting and, and now we're, we're finding a universe which is heavily populated with black holes. It is heavily populated with black holes, that's right. I mean, 
it's quite extraordinary that you know that you mentioned the first identified serious candidate for black hole, and I think that was around 1972 or something. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, people, scientists, just didn't realise that they were out there. You know, prior to that, and you know, general relativity theorists had predicted it was just part of existence. Einstein's theory. That was it. Yeah, that's right. We'd kind of wrapped up the whole um, situation with black holes in that sense well before that, you know, it was taken seriously by astronomers. And, and now, of course, we know they're everywhere. That's Professor Susan Scott from the Australian National University. Meanwhile, a separate study suggests that scientists using Caltech's Vicky Transient Facility may have spotted a light flare that's associated with the black hole merger. Now, if confirmed, it would be most surprising as black holes and their mergers are normally dark to the electromagnetic spectrum. So where did the light flare come from? Well, one theory is that the system may have been orbiting a supermassive black hole. The newly formed black hole may have received a kick from the merger, shooting off in a new direction and surging through a disk of gas surrounding the supermassive black hole, causing it to light up. While it's unlikely that the GW1905-21 detection originated from the same event as the light flare, researchers admit the possibility that it might have is intriguing. There are a number of different environments in which the system of two black holes could have formed, and the disk of gas surrounding a supermassive black hole is one of them. The discovery of this mammoth black hole merger was only possible thanks to the work of gravitational wave laser interferometer observatories. They work by sending lasers into a beam splitter, which then shoots the beams along two perpendicular multi-kilometer long tubes equipped with mirrored test masses at their ends. The reflected laser lights are then sent back to the detector, where eventually they should theoretically recombine. However, gravitational wave generated by something like a large moving mass or two merging black holes, for example, it causes the very fabric of space-time to stretch and compress ever so slightly by just a fraction the diameter of a proton. And when the gravitational wave passes the observatory, Local space-time, including the two beam lines and the test masses, are stretched and compressed ever so slightly, leaving them out of phase, the signature of the gravitational wave event. Using multiple gravitational wave detectors around the globe allows scientists to determine the direction of the gravitational wave source. The LIGO Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory comprises two identical detectors, one in Livingston, Louisiana, and the second in Hanford, Washington State. A third detector called Virgo was also used in this experiment. It's located near Pisa in northern Italy. A fourth detector, Japan's Kamioka Gravitational Wave Detector, the first to be built underground, is expected to come online later this year. And a fifth gravitational wave detector, originally offered to Australia but amazingly rejected by the then Gillard Labor government, is now under construction in India. This is space time. Still to come. A new estimate for the age of Earth's core, and China launches a top-secret reusable space plane, with the Communist Party stating that it would allow Beijing the capability to strike anywhere on Earth within half an hour. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Okay, let's take a break from our show now for a word from our sponsor, Namecheap.com. Now, as their slogan says, you can search and buy domains from Namecheap at the lowest prices. Now, this is the service that our team at Bytes use to buy and manage our domain names, and we're all really happy with the service support and value we get. In fact, we can't recommend them highly enough. Buying the right domain name shouldn't be hard, and with Namecheap, we've found it to be anything but that. You can find your dream domain and join over 2 million happy customers when you register with Namecheap, trusted with over 10 million domain names. You'll know you're in safe hands when it comes to turning your website idea into reality. And they've got some excellent tools to help find the right name for you, like the handy search engine. Just type in your desired name, cross your fingers and press search. And if what you're after is already taken, they'll offer up some great alternative ideas. If what you're looking for is some inspiration, though, why not try the new website domain name Finder Beast Mode and discover thousands of domain names really fast. We've found their prices to be excellent, management tools intuitive, and easy to use with excellent customer support should you need it. 
All in all, it's a great experience all round if you're looking to pick up a domain name or two. To check them out and help support us at the same time, just visit spacetimewithstuartgary.com slash namecheap. That's spacetimewithstuartgary.com slash namecheap. You'll be glad you did. And of course, you'll find all the URL details in the show notes and on our website. Just visit our support page. And now, it's back to the show. This is Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study suggests the Earth's solid inner core is somewhere between 1 and 1.3 billion years old. The findings, reported in the journal Physical Review Letters, places the core at the younger end of an age spectrum that usually runs from about 1.3 billion to 4.5 billion years of age. But the new work also makes it a good bit older than another recent estimate of the core, which suggests that it was only 565 million years old. The study is important because it helps to pin down the magnitude of how the core conducts heat and the energy sources that power the planet's geodynamo, the mechanism that sustains the Earth's magnetic field, which keeps compasses pointing north, and more importantly, helps shield life on the planet from the harmful effects of the solar wind and cosmic rays. The study's lead author, Jung Fulin, from the University of Texas at Austin, says knowing about the origins of the geodynamo and the strength of the magnetic field is important because it contributes to the planet's habitability. The Earth's core is mostly made of iron with a bit of nickel, with the inner core being solid and the outer core being liquid. The effectiveness of the iron in transferring heat through conduction, known as thermal conductivity, is key to determining a number of other attributes about the core including when the inner core formed. Over the years, estimates for the core's age and conductivity have gone from very old and relatively low to very young and relatively high. But these younger estimates have also created a paradox where the core would have had to reach unrealistically high temperatures in order to maintain the geodynamo for billions of years before the formation of the inner core. The new research solves that paradox by finding a solution that keeps the temperature of the core within realistic parameters. Of course, finding that solutions depended on directly measuring the conductivity of the iron under core-like conditions, where pressures are more than a million atmospheres and temperatures can reach 6,000 degrees Celsius, rivaling those on the surface of the sun. Researchers achieve these conditions by squeezing laser-heated samples of iron between two diamond anvils in a laboratory. Of course, that was no easy task, taking more than two years of trial and error in order to get suitable results. The newly measured conductivity is between 30 and 50% less than the conductivity of the young core estimate, and it suggests that the geodynamo was maintained by two different energy sources and mechanisms, thermal convection and compositional convection. At first, the geodynamo was maintained by thermal convection alone, but now each mechanism plays an equally important role. Lynn says the improved data on conductivity and heat transfer over time allowed him and colleagues to make more precise measurements of the age of the inner core. Knowing the heat flux from the outer core to the lower mantle allowed the authors to consider when did the Earth cool sufficiently to the point where the inner core began to crystallise. Importantly, this revised age for the inner core could correlate with a spike in the strength of Earth's magnetic field as recorded by the arrangement of magnetic materials in rocks that were formed around this time. Together, the evidence suggests that the formation of the inner core was an essential part of creating today's robust magnetic fields. This is Space Time. Still to come, China launches a new top-secret reusable space plane. And later in the science report comes the disturbing news that ice loss in Greenland and Antarctica is in line with the very worst-case scenario for climate change predictions. All that and more coming up on Space Time. China has launched a new top-secret reusable space plane for the People's Liberation Army. The experimental spacecraft was launched aboard a Long March 2F rocket from the Zhuquan Satellite Launch Center in northwestern China's Gobi Desert. The spacecraft, which remained shrouded in mystery, was placed into a 350-kilometer-high orbit for two days, deploying a satellite before returning to Earth. Now, based on the spacecraft's orbital track, it would have landed in the Taklamakan Desert in northwestern China. 
Beijing's been working on reusable space plane technology for more than a decade. Under a range of code names, including Shenglong or Divine Dragon, Project 863-706, and the Tengyuan or Cloud Climber project. While we're yet to see any details of the space plane used for this launch, it's thought to pretty well be a copy of Boeing's X-37B using designs stolen from America. After all, the Russians built their Buran space shuttle by simply stealing the designs from America's space shuttle. As to the true purpose of China's new space plane, well, the best clue probably comes from the Communist Party's Global Times news agency, which says Beijing should have the capability to strike anywhere on Earth within half an hour, just as the X-37B does. Which, by the way, isn't true. An X-37B orbit would take 90 minutes. This is Space Time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. The controversial early introduction of the Russian COVID-19 vaccine Sputnik V may have been a gamble with people's lives, but so far at least, the formulations appear to be safe. A report in the Lancet Medical Journal claims the early results of Sputnik V appear to be promising. Russian researchers report that the two trials, there are two separate, though related formulations being used, include 37 healthy adults in each trial, and they didn't find any serious adverse effects among participants. The authors also confirmed that both vaccines provoked an immune response. The Russians are now ready to move to the next stage, larger long-term trials, which include a placebo control. The COVID-19 pandemic, which spread globally from its origins in Wuhan, China, has now killed over 900,000 people worldwide and infected more than 28 million others. New measurements have confirmed that the ice loss in Antarctica and Greenland is in line with the very worst-case scenario predicted by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The findings, based on detailed systematic satellite observations, show that Greenland and Antarctica have lost a combined 6.4 trillion tonnes of ice between 1992 and 2017. That ice melt has increased global sea levels by 17.8 millimetres over that period. The study, reported in the journal Nature Climate Change, warns that the ice mass loss has been increasing rapidly, matching scientists' worst-case sea level rise scenario predictions given to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Scientists warn that if these rates continue, ice cap melts expected to raise sea levels by a further 17 centimetres, exposing an additional 16 million people to annual coastal flooding by the turn of the century. The findings are based on data from multiple satellite missions, including ESA's ERS-1, ERS-2, NVSAT, Cryosat and Sentinel-1 spacecraft, which were used to monitor changes in the ice sheet's volume, flow and mass. A new study warns that mobile apps are now harvesting data on preschool children. A report in the Journal of the American Medical Association looked at 451 apps used by 124 preschool kids on Android devices. It found 303, or around two-thirds, were sending identifiable data to third parties, and some were sending that data to as many as 33 different organizations. The authors found that older kids, those with their own devices, or those from lower education households, were likely to be at the highest risk for potential privacy violations. Overall, fewer than 1 in 10 kids were using apps that didn't pass their data on to third parties. The study suggests that serious violations of child digital privacy laws are in fact commonplace among app developers. A handheld video game console allowing indefinite gameplay might be a parent's worst nightmare, but it's now a reality and could soon be coming to a computer or gaming store near you. The new retro-looking Game Boy, developed by Northwestern University and the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands, is a proof-of-concept prototype, pushing the boundaries of battery-free computing. Instead of batteries, the device uses solar panels around the screen and accumulates additional energy harvested as the player mashes the buttons. If you're wondering why, despite the billions of dollars being spent, educational standards have been plummeting in countries like Australia and the United States, 
and why kids are leaving school without a good basic knowledge of the euphemistically described three R's, well, it really does come down to the poor standard of some of our teachers and the agendas they're pushing. A letter recently published in a new book, A Reluctant Icon, Letters to Neil Armstrong, provides a breathtaking example of everything that's wrong with our education system. As Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics explains, a teacher someone entrusted to educate our most valuable resource, our kids, wrote a letter to the first human to set foot on the moon, accusing him of making the whole thing up. Yeah, well, the reluctant icon is, is the story of Neil Armstrong, right? And he was a very, very uh, uh, reluctant hero. He, he, he wasn't someone who gave a lot of media interviews and that sort of stuff, but people wrote to him, obviously. And that book is about letters written to Neil Armstrong and his responses, if they have them. But this is a particular one that was quoted was one that was written in 2000 by a teacher who wrote to Neil Armstrong said, I have, a, as a teacher of young children, I have a duty to tell them history as it truly happens and not a pack of lies and deceit. And she's saying that the moon landing never happened, blah, 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 fake, all this sort of stuff. And Neil Armstrong responded and said, your letter mystifies me, your letter expressing doubts based on the sceptics, not us sceptics, by the way, on the sceptics and conspiracy theorists mystifies me. And they said, uh, why are you talking to me? Because I'm obviously be one of, the, one of the liars. He said, there's so many things which, which make it sort of unlikely that there are at least about 400,000 Americans who worked on the project in one capacity or another, and you're saying all of them kept it quiet. And at the same time, all the other nations that uh, observed the flight of the Apollo, including Russians, who would obviously take great delight if it never happened in exposing it, they didn't. So basically, he wrote back to this teacher, and I don't know if they were a science teacher. <laughs> Hopefully not. Hopefully not. Hopefully well, not. The but it's not guaranteed. Thought, the fact that they were in control of forming young minds is concerning enough. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, he wrote back. He just basically puts it down. Totally, with some very, very simple observations. And he, he doesn't go into all the supposed evidence that about, you know, whether things on the moon, etc. Although he does point out that um, people have bounced uh, lasers off the lunar reflectors that were put there by him and by others. So they do exist on the moon and they have have evidence that they've hit them with lasers, which then bounce back a signal. Yeah, my friend but, George uh, often criticised the moon landings as being hoaxes. And uh, I've had to go through the whole gamut with him about uh, the laser reflectors and about, no, there were no Hollywood with numbers written on the rocks and the shadows do really line up and and the flag was waving because it was pushed, not because there was a wind and the different light exposures and all this. It, it's amazing the things they'll raise and each one has a perfectly plausible scientific explanation, but they'll then try to gish gallop you with one thing after the other. That's right. It's the same as the 9-11 conspiracy theorists. Yeah, right, but they, they put forward a lot too, of... Of course. <laughs> yeah, well, they tend to be. They tend to, if they've got one, they've got them all, uh, you know. Nothing, if not uh, generous with their beliefs. But, uh, yeah, it's, they do that. They throw all these things at you, which have been, frankly, debunked over and over and over again. But uh, they still keep cropping up the same the same arguments. And uh, it's quite depressing after a while. You think, oh, again, you think. And, yeah, we've published articles which we lay out all the responses to all these things. And uh, you think, yeah, so at least that's there as a reference. One of my favourite all-time stories about the Apollo moon landings was uh, a dude who walked up to Buzz Aldrin and caught him a liar to his face. And uh, Buzz Aldrin's response was... He decked thought, him, yeah. He decked him, and I thought that was <laughs> so appropriate. Yeah, it's, it's just depressing the way it keeps going. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. And that's the show for now. Space Time is broadcast on Science Zone Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and through both iHeartRadio and on TuneIn Radio. Or you can subscribe and download Space Time as a free podcast through Apple, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube, Audio Boom, Podbeam, Android, Castbox, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite download podcast provider. You can help support the show and the work we do by visiting the Spacetime online shop and grabbing yourself a few goodies, or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to commercial-free double-episode versions of the show, as well as bonus audio content and other rewards. Just go to our Patreon page through spacetimewithstuartgary.com for all the details. If you want more space time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lower case, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter. 
at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 